Would Lamar Jackson or Derek Carr be a better fit for the Jets? How about Tom Brady? Which injury impacted the Jets most in 2022? We'll discuss all this and more on today's mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, January 18th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com, thanking you for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button where you are watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help the channel out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your football franchise? Then this game is definitely for you. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. Our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code LOCKEDON, all caps, in the game. Well, today we have our weekly mailbag. Thank you to everybody who sent in mailbag questions. And let's begin with a question about the Jets quarterback situation. And the question is, would you rather trade three first round picks for Lamar Jackson or one first round pick for Derek Carr? Now, my position on this is probably going to be controversial. And I want to preface this by saying I'm not sure I would necessarily trade three first-round picks for Lamar Jackson. I really would need to think through how much I'd give up for Jackson because every player has their price. And I'll also preface this by saying I do not think the Jets are going to be serious players for Lamar Jackson. I could be surprised. Last year, I did not think the Jets were going to draft Brees Hall in the second round, and they ended up doing it. And I was very happy because I really wanted Brees Hall. If the question is, which player would I pursue harder, the answer is Lamar Jackson. And yes, I understand the price tag will be higher with Lamar Jackson than it will be with Derek Carr. Sometimes, though, you get what you pay for in this league. Now, there are situations, of course, where you got to try and find bargains. The quarterback position is a spot where you spend big. Over the lifetime of this podcast, I frequently have complained about the Jets spending big in situations where it seems inappropriate to me. And that was when they signed Trumaine Johnson back in 2017, or I think it was 2018, uh, C.J. Mosley a year later. Those were situations where it really did not make sense to me for the Jets to use a lot of resources to bring in one player because those were players who really weren't really great fits for what the Jets were trying to build at that point, and they just were not guys who changed the course of the franchise. If you look across the landscape of the NFL right now, there's one quarterback who could be available, and I'm still a little skeptical Baltimore's really going to make him available, but there's really only one quarterback who, acquiring him, you know could alter your franchise in a very positive way, and that's Lamar Jackson. And I understand the question marks with him about how he's going to how his game will age because so much of it is based on his incredible speed and his running ability. I have to be honest with you, the whole idea that he's a running quarterback... Um, so he's more susceptible to injury. I know he's been injured at the end of the last couple of seasons, but I'm a little skeptical on that idea because, and I, I, my mind has changed on this. I used to think running quarterbacks were more at risk for injury than just guys who were confined to the pocket. But yeah, I've read a couple theories on this and it makes sense to me. There's one by uh, Paul Johnson, who was a great option coach in the college game. And his argument was that you know, when you're running the ball, you can protect yourself. You can see where the defenders are coming from. You can slide. And even if you take a hit, you can kind of dish out some of the damage because you're moving forward. Whereas when you're just standing in the pocket, you're just waiting for guys to hit you. So in that sense, maybe you're a little bit more in danger when you're just standing in the pocket. So, you know, I don't know that I buy that Lamar is that much more injury prone or that much greater of an injury risk than other quarterbacks. There's also this mistaken idea I think that Lamar is just a runner now he's a dynamic runner and he's the type of guy you can run an unconventional offense with that features the quarterback in the run game but if you look at his 
career, he's been at least league average as a passer, close to it almost all almost his entire career. And there were seasons where he was well above average as a passer. So yeah, I don't really buy the argument that he's a runner only. Again, I look at this. There's one quarterback who, if you put him on the Jets, the Jets are a radically different team for the better. You know, how many times does a guy who's and I, I think it's difficult to argue that Lamar Jackson's anything other than a top ten quarterback right now. Derek Carr would not be a bad fallback option, and I think he's the type of guy who could bring you stability for a couple of years. And the Jets have lacked stability at the quarterback position. He can give you a certain floor on the caliber of his play, which would be welcome for the Jets, and it would buy them, you know, maybe a couple of years to find the the solution long term in the draft. So I think Derek Carr is perfectly fine as a fallback option, but I, I'd go with Lamar like, because I think you put Lamar Jackson on this team and you, what he brings to this offense this year and you combine him with the Jets defense, Jets suddenly are a team that can make a lot of noise in the AFC. You know, I think it's easy to forget how, what, how this team was looking halfway through the season after they beat the Buffalo Bills to go six and three, they beat the team that's, you know, got a shot to go to the Super Bowl this year. Uh, so you add Lamar Jackson to the mix. I mean, I, I'm envisioning the, the option play with Lamar Jackson and Brees Hall. The Jets will become a dynamic run team practically overnight with Brees returning and Lamar in the mix. Now, again, I think a lot of this is just kind of wishful thinking, but I'd give up a lot to get Lamar Jackson. I understand, listen, every move you make has got some risk, especially when you're using up a lot of resources. But at some point, you got to roll the dice if it can really, really improve your team. The problem with the Jets over the last 10 years is that when they've spent big, it's been for guys who really can't make that big of a difference. Totally different situation here with Lamar Jackson. Derek Carr, again, a nice quarterback, a guy who is probably more attainable than Lamar Jackson. There's a reason for that because he doesn't bring everything Lamar Jackson brings to the table. But I think Lamar's the guy. Uh, you know, if, if there's an opportunity to get Lamar Jackson and the Jets don't make a big play for him, I think that they've made a mistake. Maybe it wouldn't work out, but... Sometimes you've got to roll the dice, and this is, a, to me, a situation where you have to roll the dice because you have a team that's got a very strong defense. You've got other pieces on the offensive side of the ball. you still got Brees Hall. You've got Garrett Wilson. You've got pieces that can go with Lamar, and I think that people are maybe underestimating how big of a leap, how much it would improve the team to go from bottom of the league quarterback play to elite quarterback play, and I think that's what Lamar would give you even understanding all the risks. Our next question, was the 2022 Jets defense overrated or did they perform as expected? I actually think the Jets defense this year was underrated. They're getting so much grief, and I understand it to a certain extent because they did not show up the last couple weeks of the season, or the last couple weeks they were alive. They did show up against Miami Week 18, but let me give you some numbers here. The Jets scored the fourth fewest points in the league. They allowed the fourth fewest points in the league. So your offense was bottom four point wise. Your defense was top four point wise. You know, the fourth best defense by scoring in the league, the fourth fourth worst offense scoring in the league. Why are we acting like these units deserve an equal level of blame? Yeah, I understand you could point to individual games. The Seattle game they played terribly. I think the Jacksonville game they were not good enough. They gave up the game-losing play against Detroit. Listen, understanding all of that, but over the course of the entire season, there were only three teams in the NFL that allowed fewer points. So yes, you can pinpoint individual moments where they were not good, and some of these individual moments were quite quite critical in the way the Jets' season played out and quite critical in the season ending in disappointment. But over the course of the full season, they were right there with everybody. I see people say that the Jets' defense was far from elite. Now listen, maybe it wasn't the best defense in the league. Maybe it wasn't number two. And you, listen, your de- your definition of elite could play a role in this. You may think that there, you have to be a top two, top three defense to be elite. But the Jets' defense was a playoff caliber defense. In fact, you could even say it was a type of a defense that of the caliber that you know you could make a run in the playoffs. And this goes back to the previous question. You add a quarterback like Lamar Jackson to that mix, and you improve this offense from fourth worst to, you know, even middle of the pack, Jets suddenly become a team that can make a lot of noise. So I, I would argue that the Jets' defense was underrated this year because people really have a, seem to have a lot of negative feelings, at least as far as I can tell, and I don't know that it's entirely justified. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we'll continue to talk about the quarterback position. We've talked about 
Lamar Jackson. We've talked about Derek Carr. There's a question about Tom Brady. Could he come to the Jets? Would it make sense? Is it even a possibility? Uh, We'll talk about that as we continue this Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Have you ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your football franchise? I'm sure you have, because today we're talking about off-season moves the Jets could make. Well, your dream can come true, and this game's definitely for you if that's the case. You can manage every strategic aspect of your team, play through the season, and lead your team to glory. In this game, you are responsible for hiring the right coaches and coordinators, trading picks, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through free agency and the draft and all the ups and downs of the season. You can make trades, you can sign guys, you can do it all. And it's all in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline, play on the go as you want to and when you want to. Locked On Jets listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On all caps in the game store. Again, that's Locked On. It's one word with no space in all capital letters. So make sure to check it out today. And to download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. Again, that's ultimate-gm.com. Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listener, first watch every day. This podcast is free and available on all platforms including YouTube. Our next question as we continue our weekly mailbag. John, I've seen in recent articles about the quarterback situation of the New York Jets that Tom Brady could be a consideration. If this were ever to happen, I'll state my case that I officially resign as a fan of the New York Jets. What would you do? Well, my issue with Brady is not that he played for the Patriots for two decades and won six Super Bowls with them. I don't really have an issue with that. And I think People say that. I understand why people say that, because this guy's been the enemy for two decades. So you think this guy's the enemy. We can't support him. So I understand why people say that. But I think things change once the guy becomes a member of your team. You know, I, so, you know, I've seen this so, happen so often. What people are saying, what Jets fans are saying about Brady is not very different from what Vi- Minnesota Vikings fans said about Brett Favre years ago. And then Favre became a Viking and you know fans loved him. You, know, you see it across sports. I remember back you know, when I was a kid. Yankees fans hated Roger Clemens, and then the Yankees got Roger Clemens, and everything was fine. Uh, you know, there were Cleveland Cavaliers fans after LeBron James left to go be play with the Miami Heat, who said, "I'd never want this guy back." Then he came back, and everybody loved him. So, you know, once you get a guy, I think things change completely, and I would not have an issue with it from that standpoint. Here's my issue with Tom Brady. He's going to be 46 years old, and not only not only is he going to be 46 years old, he's showing signs of decline. And listen, it's amazing that he's been as great for as long as he's been. Uh, Not that long ago, I was mocking the idea because there was all this talk that Brady wanted to play into his mid-40s. I said, there's no way he's going to sustain that level of play. And he's done it. It's actually pretty amazing how long he's been this great. But time has a way of catching up with everybody, even Brady. And listen, I mean, some of Brady's greatness into his 40s has been about rules changes where you can't hit quarterbacks the way you used to be able to play you know if Brady was playing back in the 1950s there's no way he'd be able to play into his 40s I think you know the training and nutrition has gotten better and it's allowed players to extend their careers in a way that wasn't wasn't true in the past so all this comes into play so Brady's done a remarkable job even with all that extending his career extending his level of greatness that said you know, there comes a point where you just can't do it anymore. And we've seen, listen, I think there's no question this year you saw signs of deterioration in Brady's play. Now, listen, if there's a Woody Johnson move out there, if there's like a classic vintage Woody Johnson move, it would be getting Brady just as his skills eroded. You know, the big name that doesn't really help the Jets. I don't think it'll happen, though, because it's pretty clear that Brady has a lot of negative feelings towards the Jets. And Brady's going to have other options out there. I think the only scenario where Brady would come to the Jets is similar to a scenario that played itself out in 2010 with, uh, there was a guy who was in the Hall of Fame, Jason Taylor, who was a longtime member of the Miami Dolphins. He also spent a year in Washington, the late stages of his career. And in 2010, the Jets were interested in signing him. The Jets were coming off an AFC Championship game appearance. Taylor really did not have another option. He was like a guy who was despised. You can watch some old NFL films videos about Taylor, what Taylor said about the Jets. There's one one about the Monday Night Miracle where the Dolphins jumped out to this big lead against the Jets on Monday Night Football in the year 2000. And Taylor's essentially taunting Jets fans his entire the entire game. He had nothing good to say about Jets fans. He was very vocal how much he disliked Jets fans during his career. And in 2010, the Jets made him an offer, and 
nobody else wanted him, so he took it. And he said that that was the only way he'd sign with the Jets. So, you know, in a scenario where Brady wanted to extend his career and the Jets were the only team that offered him, I could see it happening. But outside of that, I just don't see it happening. And we know Brady's going to have other options as he moves forward and, you know, into 2023 if he wants to continue playing. So I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think if it did happen, there are some people who probably would not accept him. You know, my father actually had a really tough time with Bill Parcells becoming the Jets head coach in 97 because he viewed Parcells as the Giants coach. But I think people like that are in the minority. I think something like 95% of fans who say they would never accept Brady, if he ever came to the Jets, they would. That said, it's probably not going to happen. So it's not something I think anybody really needs to worry about. Our next question, Robert Sala complained about the instant coffee mindset of fans and media, lamenting both players like Zach Wilson and coaches like Mike LaFleur need to be given time to develop into their best selves. Isn't Sala fundamentally wrong about this, that coaches need to prove their worth immediately, that you develop players, not coaches? I think that Sala is right to a certain extent. I think that it's true that everybody gets, you know, or at least most people get better the longer they do a job. Not everybody, but a lot of people do take time to fully grow into a job. Um, that said, I do think in this league, and I think it's true of players and in coaches, there's a certain threshold of improvement. There's a certain threshold of performance you need to show. You need to, you need to show your capability right away. I think the Salah instant uh, coffee comment was kind of ridiculous because, so he made this comment at, you know, near the end of the regular season. And it was specifically about Zach Wilson. He said, he said, it was about the criticism Zach Wilson's received, and he said, everybody wants it to be like instant coffee, but it takes time to develop. And essentially what Salah was saying was, you're off base if you're criticizing Zach Wilson's level of play, because it takes time. Well, the problem with that was Salah benched Zach Wilson. So if the issue is that, you know, fans are saying, fans are being unfair, and they're saying Zach Wilson's level of play is unacceptable, and that's unfair, well, why did you bench him? Because you essentially benching him, you yourself were saying that, his level of play was unacceptable, but that's, you know, there's some coaches who give you stuff that's useful during press conferences. Sal is not really among them. Sal is the kind of guy who he says stuff to the media that you just know is not really what he thinks. There are coaches who are like that. There are coaches who are a little bit more candid. Sal is of the guy. Sal is more along the style that the stuff he says in the press conferences, you have to take with a grain of salt. And I do think that, I, well, I think it's true to a certain extent that it takes players and coaches time to develop. I also think you do need to, it's a results-oriented league, and you need to prove your worth every day, every year. And listen, it's not necessarily a case where, you know, you, it's not necessarily a case where you need to fire somebody every time they have a bad year, every time something negative happens. But I do think that, you know, if you don't do your job and you do your job very poorly, teams are justified for moving on from you as a coach. And I think that sometimes we kind of talk ourselves into the mindset that it takes time a little bit more than we should, because again, it's a league where you have to prove yourself. Now, as we continue this episode of the Locked On Jets podcast, we've been talking about quarterbacks through much of this mailbag edition. We're going to talk about improving another important position on the offense, and that's wide receiver. And I'll give you some thoughts on that as we close out this Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you should know that success in 2023 all depends on the team members you surround yourself. And that's why you have to check out, check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. Maybe the Jets should look into LinkedIn Jobs as they try and fill their offensive coordinator position to make sure they get the right candidates. LinkedIn Jobs helps you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools and they go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates you can identify the most qualified candidates on linkedin jobs and connect them fast and for free linkedin jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform and this is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on our Wednesday mailbag show. We continue our next question. John, last offseason, Joe Douglas attempted to make a big splash by trading for Tyreek Hill. The Jets have Garrett Wilson, but not a lot of playmakers other than him. Do you think we could be in the market for another receiver, big time, another number one receiver? 
Do you think we could draft one early? Or do you think the Jets have an adequate group? I think the Jets need to add to their receiver position. I think Garrett Wilson's an excellent start, but beyond that, you know, Elijah Moore just had a very disappointing season. And Corey Davis is Corey Davis. He'll give you some good games, he'll give you some bad games, and he'll miss some games from injury. He's an inconsistent receiver. You know, he'll give you, you know, he's better than what the Jets have had in the past, but I still don't think he's good enough. You know, I used to think he was a good number two receiver. Maybe he's a good third option. I think last year the Jets approached the receiver position in a, I think they made mistakes. I don't think there's any other way to put it. And the biggest mistake was they had an opportunity to add Amari Cooper for a day three pick. And they did it. They passed on it. And, you know, at the time I really I did a podcast and I said, I did not understand it. And people got upset when I said that, but Amari Cooper would, would have been a great addition. It would have been a very cost-effective addition, really would not have cost the Jets a whole lot. Cleveland wor- reworked his contract and brought his cap number way down. I, I At the time, I did not understand why the Jets failed to make a move for Cooper. And I think that the Joe Douglas approach showed that it was not a great—I think he showed it was not a great approach when they failed to land Tyree Kill. And again, on that day, I said it sh- Joe Douglas' strategy was bad because essentially— he could not control whether or not he landed Tyree Kill. He was essentially banking on getting Tyree Kill, and you know he ended up not grabbing him. And the Jets, the Jets did a good job drafting Garrett Wilson, of course, but there was no way they knew that Garrett Wilson was going to be available. They took a gamble that Garrett Wilson would be there. I felt like the Jets needed to add multiple receivers last off season, and I think that they rolled the dice that Elijah Moore was going to be a, uh, was going to be a game-breaking receiver, and he simply was not. Now, it's going to be tough this offseason. Last offseason, there was a lot of receiver movement in this league, especially among the guys who are more premium players. This year, you may not have that same level of movement, so it's tough. And also, the Jets have to address the quarterback position, so there may not be enough money uh, lying around on, in, where we're talking cap room to add both a big-time quarterback and a big-time receiver. So it might be more towards the draft that the Jets will have to look as they try and supplement what Garrett Wilson provides. Now, the other option would be, and this is not my preferred option at all, the other option would be if the Jets just decided that they were going to go with a lower-level option, a quarterback like a Jacoby Brissett, and just load skill players around him. So if they could make a move for a number-one type receiver to pair with Garrett Wilson, and you have Brees Hall back, you say, you know what, we've got so much talent on this offense that an average quarterback like Jacoby Brissett can make it work. I guess that's one option the Jets could go with, but... I think it's going to be tough, and I think the Jets really missed an opportunity last year. Amari Cooper's the guy, because he was so cost-effective. The Jets had all the resources they needed to add Amari Cooper. I mean, there was it, to me, it's totally inexplicable that they refused to do that. And Cooper went on and had a good season in Cleveland. So, uh, really, that was the miss last year. And the Jets are in a tougher spot, because they really do need to keep adding. I don't think this receiving core is good enough. I think it's better than what we've had in the past, but... I still think it's short of at least one receiver, and I think the Jets, you know, it's not going to be easy to add that guy. Our next question, which in, which injury derailed the season the most? I think it's Brees Hall by a mile. The Jets had an offensive identity with Brees Hall, and they, the other thing about Brees Hall was when he left, Zach Wilson kind of fell apart. It was the very next game after they lost Brees Hall that Zach Wilson had that three-interception game against the Patriots that kind of was the beginning of the end for him as Jets' starting quarterback. I think that with Brees Hall in the, in the lineup, the Jets probably would have been able to live with Zach Wilson for longer. And, you know, who knows how things turn out? Maybe Zach Wilson just doesn't completely lose all of his confidence because even though Zach Wilson was playing poorly up to that point, the Jets were still winning games. So Zach Wilson was not taking a lot of heat. And I think sometimes when you're bringing along a young quarterback, as much as anything, it's about just keeping the confidence level high and figuring out a way to work around the growing pain. So to me, it's Brees Hall, and he was making such a difference on offense for the Jets. He essentially was so good that the Jets really did not need to throw the ball effectively. There are not many backs in this league you can turn to to be your entire offense, but Brees Hall looked like one of them before the injury, and you hope he comes back. You hope he regains that form, but to me, I don't even think it's debate. I'm sure you could debate Elijah Vera Tucker, but I think Brees Hall was so important because he had become not just the go-to guy. He had become the entire Jets offense. And our last question, John, how do you feel about the uniform debate among fans? The Jets incorporated black in most of their games this year. Do you like black becoming a third primary color, or do you prefer the traditional green and white? You know, usually this is the type of thing I really don't care about, but it really annoyed me this year the Jets were not wearing green. That's the Jets' color. I don't understand the aversion to your using your wearing your team's colors, but 
I don't really like these uniforms to begin with. I think the Jets could certainly use a change. This is the thing I don't get about the Jets. The Jets, through their history, have had two uniform styles that I think were pretty good. You know, there was the, the one that they changed from, which were kind of were kind of like throwbacks to the name of days. But there was also the Kelly Green uniforms back from the sack exchange days, which would look pretty sharp. So I don't understand how a team that's had, and a lot of this is personal opinion. I mean, there's no definitive right or wrong answer on uniforms. It's really what, what you personally like. But I don't understand how a team that has two solid options from its history ends up in the uniforms they're wearing now. But I wish the NFL would make it easier for teams to change uniforms, because my understanding is it's like it's like a five-year process to change your uniform. So it's going to take a while. I wish the NFL would just let teams change more frequently. I wish they went to like an NBA model where every team unveils like five different uniforms every year and you get like a different look. So that way, if you have a bad look, it doesn't stick with your team forever. Because I think the Jets' uniforms don't look any good right now. And I really don't understand why the Jets are not wearing their team color, which is green. You know it's green. I know it's green. I don't know why it annoys me so much, because normally this is the type of thing I wouldn't care as long as the team was winning or losing, but it did annoy me this year that the Jets weren't wearing green. Go back to green next year, Jets. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, please give the show a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help the channel out and help other Jets fans find the podcast. Hope you have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.